salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. Here I am in front of Hubert Parry's house on Kensington Square in London. Uh, so he's a celebrated composer of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and the United Kingdom doesn't have that many composers. It really can't look countries like France, Austria, Germany, Italy, or Russia in the face, but Parry is one of the better known ones. I'm a complete non-musician, but even I've heard of him. Uh, now, Parry wasn't born, born here. He was born, appositely enough, in Bournemouth. Uh, so his father, Gambier um, uh, Parry, was mainly a gentleman of leisure, uh, an amateur musician, played the French horn, uh, the piano and the cello, if I've got that right. Um, the family had made a huge fortune in the East India Company in the 18th century, uh, which enabled them to um, live this life. Uh, so his dad, being a gentleman of leisure, spent a lot of his time purchasing Italian objets d'art and um, painting, just for fun. So a, a nice lifestyle if you can get it. And they had a family seat in Gloucestershire, as well as their large house in, in um, Bournemouth. Um, so Parry was the Benjamin of a brood of six children. But um, his life was touched by tragedy. Um, three of the six died in childhood, including one of his sisters died when, when um, she wasn't young. If, I mean, if, if, if a newborn dies, yes, it's a heavy blow, but at least you didn't know the person as an individual. But when the child lives to be several years old, it's much harder because you know the character so attached to that child. And so one of his sisters died when he was away at boarding school, but I should have not skipped onto this. When he was only 12 days old, his mother died of, of consumption. I think that's the same thing as tuberculosis wonder how she got through the pregnancy but there we are um, so he um, was mostly brought up by his governess um, he had a much older brother Clinton a much a brother older sister um, but his father was often traveling around mainland Europe purchasing Italian art um, his mother so his father married again and had a few more children so um, materially he wanted for nothing but he was rather lacking in in parental attention and I wonder if his elder siblings blamed him for the death of their mother at all. That, that's just sheer conjecture on my part. So he went to a uh, prep school at Twyford, which I think still exists. Uh, it's this lovely uh, valley in, in um, uh, Berkshire. And uh, he simply um, hero-worshipped his music teacher there, who introduced him to, to various composers. I was quite imaginative for the time. And I don't know very much about music, so I can't speak in any depth about uh, his musical compositions. Uh, then he went on to Eton, where his father had also been educated. His elder brother Clinton had been sacked not long before for dipsomania, um, allegedly having an affair with a boy's maid, as in she was meant to tidy up the room, um, and uh, taking, taking opium. Now, opium was entirely legal in this country. Um, this was produced in India, sold in China and here. You could, you could buy it for recreational use. I don't think there's any minimum age limit, but nevertheless, the school could say you're not allowed to have it. Like when I was at school, the smoking age was, was 16. But nonetheless, you weren't allowed to smoke at school even if you're 18. So school, school doesn't necessarily go by the law of the land. It's often more stringent. And his brother Clinton, he then went up to Oxford, where he was rusticated, allowed back in, and then he was finally sent down from Oxford for good. Um, now, part of the problem with Clinton was frustrated musical ambitions. He wanted to be a musician, his father wouldn't hear of it, saying that that was no calling for a man of his social standing. Um, but. And, and they felt the same about um, about uh, Hubert. Mmm, well, my olfactory sense is stimulated. What do you call these plants? I don't know. I know so little about these sort of things, but um, they're so fragrant, and they're just they're just coming into blossom now. You see a few, a few, because it's, it's, it's equinox tonight. You see these white um, flowers there. So it'll be blooming spring soon. Rather chilly, though, this late spring, with a high wind up so much of the time. You see the branches moving over my head um, anyway so back back to Hubert Parry um, and the the curriculum consisted almost entirely of classics at the time uh, the Clarendon Commission met when he was there because he went up to Eton in 1861 uh, the Clarendon Commission it was named in honor of Lord Clarendon looked at nine schools I can't quite remember all the nine but certainly Eton Harrow Winchester a few more it's something like City of London school something a bit surprising like that Shrewsbury rugby I uh, don't remember the rest. So some of the most famous um, boys uh, uh, boarding schools in the realm, and they were all in England, none in Ireland, Wales or Scotland. 
But anyway, um, they weren't completely satisfied with the situation and seeing are these boys being decently educated, are they being treated humanely and so forth, and bullying was rife, the schools tried to regulate it, they can't stamp it out completely, we have a fagging system as in some of the younger boys have to act as a servant for the older boys. But in a way that did people good because if you came from an upper class family like, like Parry, you saw what it was to be a servant. Okay, you developed a certain sympathy for the lower orders. And then people say, well, that's why that the upper class couldn't treat the lower orders too abysmally, because they, they could empathize with them. They'd had to do it. And they'd had to learn how to polish shoes and cook and clean and fetch and be at someone's beck and call. You're beholden under someone else. Whereas the upper class in other countries would have never imagined doing that. Um, so there wasn't such a wide gulf here between the different social orders as there was in other lands. Anyway, and the, the, the Reverend Balston, or Balston, I don't know how to pronounce it, I think Balston, it's a single L, was a headmaster of Eton at the time. Of course, Eton spells it two words, head, master. Everyone else spells it as a single word. Um, he was... He was um, uh, questioned by the Clarendon Commission, and he said there was um, a time for almost nothing else besides Latin and Greek in the curriculum. He said French should be taught but shouldn't be mandatory, and there was almost no science of maths, and music was a very minor thing, just just the, the choir singing in chapel. So Eaton couldn't provide for his, this boy's musical tastes and talents, and therefore he went across the Thames to um, Sir George's Chapel, Windsor, where there was some clergyman in charge of music. He was taught by him. However, he wasn't as good as um, the bloke, I think his name was S.S. Wilde, as music teacher at Twyford. Um, so Parry musically was raised on Mozart, on Haydn, Mendelssohn, uh, and a few others. Uh, so these were unimaginative uh, choices. Um, anyway, then he went up to Exeter College, Oxford, um, and he was reading law and uh, history. Uh, not music. Music was it was a side thing. Yes, he could sing in the choir. He's learning a few instruments, but this was just to be for um, uh, recreation. It couldn't couldn't be uh, the mainstay. Anyway, he, he graduated um, and uh, he then went out to London and he got a handsomely remunerated job at Lloyd's of London as in um, insurance brokers. But he found that completely unfulfilling and tedious. It didn't suit someone of his artistic temperament. So he branched out to music, taking music lessons, raising his ability in, 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 in um, music, uh, studying musicology, meeting composers as well as musicians. Um, and he decided to jack in. I'm not sure why he was looking for a, a well-paid job because he didn't need one. He had ample family money. Uh, and he got married to Sidney Herbert's daughter. He, she, he was a well-known MP, Herbert. Um, and so eventually he gave up insurance. He said it really his heart wasn't in it. So he wasn't that good at insurance. But, you know, he had the education, he had the right social contacts. So it was easy for him to get um, a good job like that. And then he threw himself into composing oratorios in particular, um, some, some of it religious music. So what's he really well known for? I was glad, that, that tune, I was glad when they said unto me, go up to the house of the Lord, which was so memorably canticled at the hand fasting of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Um, and indeed the mu Music Science Society Eaton has named the Parry Society in honour of Hubert Parry. Well, by the way, Hubert wasn't his middle name, it was his middle name, he's actually Charles. Uh, and then um, he'd largely retired by the time the First World War came out, uh, along, he was 68. No, sorry, he was 66, and that was very old in those days. Remember, life expectancy was about 60 back then. They set, they set um, the pension age at 65, and that was beyond life expectancy. Most would pay into the pension scheme and never claim a brass farthing. But then the First World War came out, and, and people were brought back out of retirement, and he was conscripted into doing his bit to raise people's spirits. Um, he previously worked on, on, on um, some of the poesy of, of, of another old Italian, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who'd been an outcast, but, um, but then was, was co-opted by the establishment posthumously and turning one of his works, I think it's Prometheus Un Unbound, into, into a work of music, well, writing some music to the, to the lyrics. I don't think it was meant to be lyrical at all. Um, anyhow, how, are they going to, how is he going to lift the nation's spirits in this cherry moment for morale? So he took William Blake's poem, Jerusalem, and, and William Blake was, I don't know if he was a pacifist, but certainly not especially a patriotic, believing in the brotherhood of man, a radical, someone who felt disdain for the royal family, um, who felt that the, the Napoleonic War was not worth fighting. Presumably, someone of his mindset would have felt um, similarly about the Great War for Civilization, or the First World War, as we more commonly call it. So, um, uh, taking Blake's poem 
and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen um, and did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills and was Jerusalem builded here among our dark satanic mills bring me my bow of burning gold bring me my arrows of desire bring me my bow O clouds unfold bring me my chariot of fire I shall not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land so that was um, uh, Blake's poem I'm sorry I didn't declaim it uh, terribly well I hadn't been anticipating doing so and it was just a poem so it's based on this legend that Jesus Christ visited this island during his lifetime. There's no <laughs> biblical evidence or historical reason to believe that he did, but I, I think it was um, a uh, medieval whimsy, that one. Um, but he's, uh, w w what's the message of, of, of Jerusalem? I suppose trying to make the country more moral, more Christian in the best sense of the word. Um, he, wants to be, uh, he wants to be armed for a mental fight, not physical fight. Um, and say there are dark satanic mills when industrial, industrialization was beginning and many people had a pretty horrific life and that's why the, the film chariots of fire takes its name from that remember the prophet elijah he didn't die he had i can't remember what dormition is that the, is that the word in this particular case certainly in a chariot of fire taken up to heaven that way uh, a bit like a very very favored people like the blessed virgin has a resumption you know, reading all the, the the translation of these these names of various Orthodox churches, they often say Dormition, and I thought, well, you wouldn't know what that is unless you're a real scholar of theology. It's the assumption, and the average Catholic, at least, would know. But uh, so Parry uh, turned Jerusalem into a hymn, and uh, it was road tested at Royal Albert Hall, and it went down a storm, and it certainly put steel in the soul of many a Tommy, and has been belted out uh, in many a school chapel ever since. So uh, it's a fabulous uh, crowd pleaser. The melody really sets the blood racing. Um, anyway, he contracted Spanish flu in, in, in 1918. Flu sans change, something like that is, is, is racing around the world not right now. Not that Spain was particularly severely affected. It's only that a wartime censorship um, offended people from reporting it was here, lest it depress spirits even more so than they already were, given the hundreds of thousands of people who've been slaughtered. Um, so that's why the name Spanish flu stuck, or somehow to think to, to, to make people think the government's response wasn't feeble or cack handed, a bit like Fox News these days, um, try calling it Chinese uh, coronavirus. I don't care whether it's Chinese or not, that doesn't mean that Trump's handling of it is any more competent. Don't blame them, they didn't cook this one up, it hasn't, it hasn't gained them anything, they've suffered from it most really impacted their economy. Anyway, I digress. So back to Hubert Parry. He died in October 1918, just before the armistice, the end of the First World War. How much did he contribute to the Allied victory in the First World War? Well, a little. You know, when times are hard, when you're suffering, it certainly works for me to think of uh, these words that um, can really raise my spirits and uh, I feel my scalp moving, adrenaline pumping, uh, my strength is redoubled. And perhaps he did that for the Allies with Jerusalem um, that he uh, set to music. Well, that's enough about uh, Hubert Parry. Toodaloo.